Good evening and welcome to our webinar, TikTok Ticks, FND and TS. My name is Angela Sullivan, Manager of Programs at the TAA, and I will be your moderator this evening. This webinar is being provided as part of the Tourette Health and Education Program, a program of the Tourette Association of America in partnership with the CDC. During the webinar, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would like to mention that funding for this webinar was made possible by our cooperative agreement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views expressed by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening, Drs. Keith Kaufman and Dr. Julio Quezada. Dr. Kaufman is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, and Dr. Quezada is also at Children's Mercy Hospital, and they are both here with us to share some really great information. They both have lengthy bios, um, so I will direct you to Tourette.org if you'd like to learn more. So with that, you can go ahead with your presentation. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. So um, I am Keith Kaufman, as Angela said, and so to follow up the disclosures, um, I don't have any relationship with any commercial entity, meaning I don't own stock in anything. We're actually not going to talk about anything where that would be relevant. Um, okay, so first we're going to talk about what is a tick. So a tick is a sudden involuntary, rapid, recurrent, non-rhythmic, meaning you can't set a beat to it, um, stereotyped, meaning it looks or sounds the same every single time, movement or vocalization. Okay. So part of the reason we're having this uh, discussion and, and this session this evening is that over the course of the last uh, two years, since the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, in early 2020, around the world, uh, not just in the United States, around the world, there has been a tremendous rise in um, the development of tick-like movements and sounds uh, in young people uh, worldwide. Um, this is not a US phenomenon worldwide that in very, very many ways um, do not um, resemble tick disorders or Tourette syndrome. And what we are here to do this evening is to help clarify um, what this phenomenon is, uh, why um, in large part it is not related um, in any way to Tourette, except for a couple situations that I will discuss. Um, and how you can identify and, and sort of, you know, realize which direction you need to go if anybody that you know uh, or care for is experiencing these phenomena. Okay. So first off, um, and what I'm going to do is present how ticks and, and Tourette syndrome presents, and Dr. Quezada is going to contrast that with how this phenomenon has, has presented. So tick disorders typically present in childhood. They're a childhood phenomenon that really begins in the preschool ages, as you can see, um, with the latest onset in, in the mid-teenage years, except for one research study that showed that a small portion of patients develop symptoms after the age of 18. When we look at tics and, and tick disorders, we now know that tick disorders are incredibly common. So when we look worldwide, um, the prevalence of all tick disorders is about 20 to 60 per 1,000. So if you do the division there, that get rid of the zeros, that's two to six per 100, then you divide by two, you get one to three per 50. So tick disorders are incredibly common worldwide. When we take Tourette syndrome and chronic tick disorder, which are the two tick disorders that last longer than a calendar year, the rate is 1% of the population worldwide. So it's an incredibly common thing in the world of pediatric disease disorders. When we look at Tourette and chronic tick disorder together, um, about 25% of people with Tourette 
are female. 75% are uh, male. Okay. In contrast, this phenomenon, um, what has been published is that upwards of 90 plus percent of people affected by this phenomenon are female. So in, in no way consistent with what we know about uh, tick in that regard. When we look and say, okay, somebody who's got a tick disorder or possible tick disorder, what kind of questions do you ask about whenever you see them in the office? So we ask about the big four. Uh, the big four are ADHD, which occurs in a rate of about 50 to 60 percent, uh, OCD, which occurs at a rate of about 20 to 30 percent, anxiety, which is again about 20 to 30 percent, and then the one we don't know enough about in terms of uh, incidence rate is intermittent explosive behavior. When the researchers around the world have examined this new phenomenon, what they have found is very, very low rates of OCD and, and ADHD, very high rates of anxiety, higher than we would ever see in, in studies of Tourette, and incredibly high rates, over 50%, um, of depression, not what we see in Tourette at all. These uh, characteristics of Tourette in terms of the phenomenon that we see, the ADHD, OCD, anxiety, um, we always find these conditions in, when we're seeing patients who present with concern for tick or Tourette, um, either in the patients themselves, their immediate family, or their extended family. The relationships genetically between tick disorders and these three conditions um, is so strong that researchers who are doing genetic research on Tourette have to exclude from their control group, so the people without Tourette, they have to exclude anybody with ADHD, OCD, or anxiety because those conditions are so tightly genetically related to Tourette syndrome and tick disorders that you can't make any sense of the genetic data. And that's not what's been found so far in, in the studies around the world of this phenomenon. Tick onset is very slow. So what I mean is it has an insidious onset, meaning that you know, for, for many people, most people with tick disorders, they'll have an eye blink or a shoulder shrug or uh, a hum or a throat clear, and they'll have that for years and years. And then they may get another one. They, they may develop over time. It's a slowly progressive condition. And I'll let Dr. Quezada speak to how this condition uh, differs. One tick will start, and then a few months later, another tick will start. It's not a rapid progression. When it comes to how ticks look in terms of simplicity, um, patients with tick disorders, they'll start with very simple movements, an involuntary blink or an eye roll or a face twitch, very movements that are so subtle that Patients will be uh, sitting in the office and say, oh, what about, I'll ask them, what about that one? What? That, that eye movement you just did. Oh, I didn't even realize I did that one. Um, and then vocal tics are the same. They'll start as a snort or a sniff, uh, throat clearing, things that you do in everyday life. And that's one of the other key features of patients with tic disorders uh, and Tourette syndrome is that the movements that we see in patients with Tourette, for the large majority, and I'll cover the rare circumstances where they, where they look different, the large majority of tics, either motor or vocal, are things that we all do naturally. Patients with Tourette just do it a lot more than we do. Um, and then when it comes to body location, um, tics are predominantly located in the head, face, and neck. And this just isn't, uh, isn't just what we see phenomenologically. Research study after research study that has looked at brain imaging of patients with Tourette syndrome have shown changes only detectable by analyzing, say, the thickness of an MRI scan, have cho shown changes in the surface of the brain where these uh, re body representations are. Um, and for most patients with Tourette, um, not all, but for most, um, 
the tics are present for many years before the families seek medical attention because for most people, the tics don't disrupt life, cause pain, or interfere with quality of life. So as we talked about sort of common motor tics, so common motor tics are things that, that we all see, eye blinking, face twitching, grimacing, shoulder shrugging. Complex motor tics are more rare, and, and these are not things that show up at presentation. These are things that happen over time from someone who's had tic that's evolved over time, meaning over years. Things like jumping, body twisting, licking, twirling, um, and sort of what we call motor blocking tics, where you either stop as you're talking or stop as you're walking. Um, the other key thing is self-injurious tics, tics where you injure yourself, uh, hit yourself, are incredibly rare. When it comes to vocal tics, the most common are things, the, the three most common by far are things that every human does all the time. Sniff, snort, throat clear, okay? Yes, you can have some more unusual ones like spitting, barking, um, but there's still things that are sort of basic single sounds, right? They're not words, they're not phrases, they're not complex sentences, they're simple, simple vocalizations, okay? Complex vocal tics um, are, are really rather rare, where you have someone who has an expression of a word or phrase as part of his or her presentation of Tourette, or repeating yourself as part of your Tourette, or repeating someone else's words. These are things that um, every time I see them, and I've, I've been taking care of Tourette patients now since 2004, um, so what, 17 years. Anytime I see any of these three, I'm like, oh wow, do you know how rare that tick is? It's been years since I've seen that one. And very rare motor ticks, are the, the, what we call the copra phenomenon. So these are the involuntary, obscene, vulgar gestures that happen in a small subset of patients with Tourette, very rare after many, many years. Um, and the key thing with both copraxia and coprolalia, uh, which we will talk about, is that when you see it, when it happens, Patients who do this are incredibly troubled by doing it. They will make an obscene gesture with one hand and they'll hide it with the other hand as it's happening. They're mortified at the fact that they've done this and they apologize and wish they hadn't done it. Uh, but as you can see, it's exceptionally rare. Only five to 6% of anybody with Tourette. Echopraxia, so mimicking of somebody else's movements as an actual motor tick. Um, which is a big part of the phenomenon that we've seen. We've seen person after person, country after country, developing these movements that are exactly like things that they've seen on uh, video channels, YouTube, uh, TikTok. This phenomenon is so rare within the world of Tourette um, that's not even published in terms of how commonly it happens because Every study that's tried to look for it has not found it in significant enough rates to even give it a number in terms of percentage-wise. I personally, um, as I said, 17 years, I've seen echopraxia, so someone who, as a tick, mimics someone else's movements uncontrollably twice in 17 years. It is that rare. And we don't have to talk about palagraphy. It's one of my favorite uh, tics. I've seen it once in my career. The British refer to it as written jocularity, which is why I like to talk about it, because it sounds cool. Um, and it's repeatedly writing things over and over as a tic. Um, okay. So very rare vocal tics, coprolalia. As I said, you know, 15 to 20 percent of, of people with Tourette will have coprolalia. In this phenomenon, uh, we are seeing coprolalia be present in the large majority of patients affected by this phenomenon. And study after study of actual tic disorders, Tourette syndrome, have consistently shown, no matter where they've been done in the world, 
um, the rates are very, very low, no more than 15 to 20 percent. And only severely affected patients after years of having Tourette will develop this. One of the key things um, is that patients with tick will have worsening of their pre-existing tics with stress, excitement, fatigue, or illness. Um, when the body has something it's trying to control, a tick disorder, and anything messes with the body, illness, fatigue, excitement, the tics get worse. The other key feature of Tourette and tick disorders is what we call the premonitory urge. And this is a feeling that most patients with Tourette will have. And it's a feeling that happens before they tick that sort of tells them that they need to tick. And it's similar, if you've never had tick before, it's similar to the feeling you get before you sneeze. And if you don't sneeze, you have to rub your nose to, to make it go away. It's an unpleasant feeling. You, you don't want to react to that feeling, but you have to. And that's one of the hallmark features of, of tick disorders um, is that the patients are moving in response to an internal sensation that's telling them to move. And Dr. Quezada will contrast sort of what the other phenomenon is. Okay. Patients who have tick. Uh, or Tourette syndrome will be able to tell you. If I go here, I'll have this tick. If I go there, I'll have this tick. If I'm around this person or in this situation, they know as they've had tick for a while, sort of what pun intended, what makes them tick, sort of what helps them to really realize if I go here, I'm going to do this, so I have to prepare. Okay. Um, and the other thing is suppressibility, right? So patients with tick can suppress their ticks. They can control their ticks, keep them from happening. But in patients with Tourette, this is a very uncomfortable situation. This sometimes is very painful. It's very disruptive. They can't pay attention and focus because they're constantly trying to keep their body from moving when they don't want it to. They know they don't want to move. Um, and I'll have, and Dr. Quezada will contrast. Uh, and ticks are what we call distractible. So this is a misnomer, uh, but it's the best term we have. And what that means is um, that say you are on the sidelines and you're having a bunch of ticks, you go into a sporting event to play and your ticks go away magically. Um, it's because your brain flipped motor programs and that's why you're not ticking anymore. Um, I'll have Dr. Quezada talk about suggestibility because that's seen in both phenomenon. And other big thing, the overlap with patients with tick and obsessive compulsive is they feel like they have to do their tick a certain number of times so that it feels just right. And that's not present in this other phenomenon. So we don't know what causes Tourette. It's a neurodevelopmental condition. It starts in childhood and tends to get better as you get into your teens and adulthood. It waxes and wanes, sort of comes and goes. Most severe time is 9 to 15 based on what's been shown with a peak severity of about 12. And that's remarkably different than this other phenomenon that has been shown consistently, no matter who's researched it, to be much older in terms of when it shows up and, and what uh, ages it affects. With tick, the best study, best study that was ever done was done over a decade ago that shows that ticks improve as you get older and really start to improve as you get into the teenage years in contrast to this phenomenon. So the other big thing is when patients with tick have ticks that bother them, have ticks that interfere with their quality of life, they tell us, they tell their parents. They will ask to schedule appointments. They'll ask their parents to call us. They'll be frustrated, irritated, report pain with ticks that should be painful. If you look at that tick and say, wow, that one I bet hurts. Yes, Dr. Kaufman, it hurts. Can you please make it stop? And Dr. Quezada will contrast. Um, and the other big thing with this phenomenon versus Tourette and tick disorders is that sleep becomes disrupted from ticks keeping people awake at night. Okay, 
So this is our team. Uh, this is beautiful downtown Kansas City, Missouri, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, this is the front of our hospital, and that is the end of my time. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about functional neurological disorder and contrast with a lot of the stuff that Dr. Kaufman has already uh, discussed. I'll start off by saying that, you know, functional neurological disorder or FND is also known by another name of conversion disorder, which is not completely an acceptable term anymore. Um, <clears throat> but I do like that term because it helps to understand what's happening in patients who have FND. So it's called conversion disorder because it's a condition in which the brain or the mind, which are the same thing, take a stimulus, whether it's internal or external, whether it's good or bad, and it converts it into a physical symptom. So patients who have FND or who have what used to be called conversion, they can have symptoms that look like a specific neurological illness, but it's not due to that neurological illness. So patients who have FND can have what looks like uh, seizures, but are not seizures. Those are known as non-epileptic seizures. They can have what looks like a tick, but is not really a tick. It's what we call a function, uh, tick-like movement or functional tick. They can have what looks like a stroke, but isn't actually a stroke. Um, there's also symptoms of dizziness, transient blindness, transient numbness, inability to move. I mean, it can present with any sort of neurological symptom. And that's why neurologists are the ones who are tasked with trying to tell the difference. Now, it used to be that FND was diagnosed as a diagnosis of exclusion, which meant I would do all the tests and if everything was normal, then I would fall back and say, well, this is a, uh, this is FND. Um, but we've discovered more and more that we can actually make this diagnosis as a diagnosis of inclusion, which means we can actually come to the patient and say, the reason why you have this FND symptom is because of X, Y, and Z reason. Now, today we're talking about the tick specifically. And there are several characteristics to the tick-like movements or functional ticks that we know about that really help us as physicians to tell the difference. Number one, the age at which it presents. Like Dr. Kaufman noted, ticks will, in Tourette syndrome will present in patients when they are about four to six years old, they're much younger, and then very slowly over time, gradually, over many years, increase in their frequency and get, and get worse. Whereas for patients with uh, FND, the onset is not like that at all. It shows up very acutely and in a very explosive manner, and it shows up in the teenage years, which is when ticks start to go away in patients who have uh, Tourette syndrome and other tick disorders. So it shows up at a different age, and it shows up very explosively. In fact, there was a study uh, done by Dr. P Tamara Pringsheim in the Calgary Movement Disorder Group where they uh, had a registry for adult patients who were presenting with ticks, and they would be a part of this registry. And what they found is that um, in that registry, from January 2021 to June 2021, in that six-month period, 37.5% of the patients who were enrolled had FND, or tick-like movements. And all of those patients had their ticks show up within hours to days. So they went from being people who had no ticks at all, had never had ticks, to having an explosive onset of a plethora of ticks and having over 20 or 30 ticks that showed up in a matter of days to uh, hours to days. And that's what we see clinically too. We'll see patients who have, who are in the teenage years, who will present with these uh, ticks that show up out of the blue. And when they show up, they show up with a big, uh, uh, with very ticks and they change from tick to tick to tick to tick. So each one of them is different. When asked about these movements, a lot of patients will refer that 
they sometimes feel a, a urge, a sensation to do it. But unlike what we see with Tourette syndrome, the way that they talk about their urge is it, it feels more like anxiety building up. And as that anxiety builds up, doing these movements feels good. And it's a way to release it. But unlike with Tourette syndrome, where the tick takes care of a specific urge with uh, FND, any movement, any noise will take care of the urge. So it's not, for example, patients who have a blinking tick will often say that they feel like there's sand in their eyes or there's something there and when they blink, it feels better. Um, patients with FND, there's this urge, this anxiety that builds up and then any movement, whether it's moving their hands, moving their head, saying words, anything takes care of it, which is not what's characteristic of, of patients with, with Tourette syndrome. The other thing is a lot of patients will also say that they don't recognize any premonitory urge and that sometimes these movements just happen and they don't control them at all. I've had patients describe it to me as a, this is something that's happening to me. It's something that I cannot control at all. I contrast it with tics in, in Tourette syndrome and I tell patients it's, it's a tick is kind of like when you have an itch in your arm. You can decide to not scratch that, but then that itch will get worse, worse, worse. And then what happens? You really have to scratch it, right? That's what it feels like in, in, in Tourette syndrome. In patients who have functional neurological disorder, sometimes they'll have these and they won't feel any benefit. They won't feel any change. It's just something that's happening to them. It's completely involuntary. It's like they have no say in whether or not the tick happens or, or not. And another very interesting phenomena that I see in a lot of my patients with FND is that ticks and Tourette syndrome are suppressible. Patients who have a tick will be able to hold it in, and typically a kid will be able to hold it in for the entire school day, and by the time they get home, they let it out, and it's done. Whereas patients with FND will often tell me that when they try to suppress a specific tick-like uh, movement or sound, other ticks will come out. So let's say, for example, that they can't, they don't want to say a specific word because it's inappropriate or, or, or something. If they try to stop, hold that in, they'll suddenly start to see their arm go up and down or they'll see their head shake from side to side. And that's very classic, very characteristic of patients with FND. The other interesting thing that we see in FND is what's known as tick attacks. And a lot of patients will, will come to us saying that they, they have these attacks of, you know, an explosion of 20 to 30 different movement sounds and combinations of movements and sounds that happen or, for hours and they can't stop at all. That is another very typical finding that we see in patients with, with functional neurological disorder. So when I see all these characteristics, the age at which it presents, the lack of the, the common tick characteristics and the high degree of other conditions like anxiety or depression that tend to go hand in hand with FND, this is how we make that inclusive diagnosis. It's based on what we're seeing and not as a diagnosis of exclusion where because everything has been normal, we decide to, to fall back on that diagnosis. That's not what happens at all with, with FND. Now, I always tell my patients that FND has a good side to it and a not so good side to it. The good side to FND is it is 100% treatable, curable, and it goes away. The not so good side to FND is that it could take time for it to go away and it can be difficult to go away. The other interesting thing about FND is it, it is a diagnosis that unlike any other diagnosis in medicine, the first step in treatment is delivering the diagnosis. Unfortunately, a lot of patients who have FND, when they present with their symptoms, they will report being told that they are faking it, that they are pretending. They'll be told that it's just a stress phenomena or, and that it's all in their head, which is completely untrue. We have done many studies with different imaging techniques of which functional MRI is the type of technique that's been used the most for patients with uh, FND. And what we found with functional MRIs is, is interesting. We found that in general, the, the way that the brain communicates with itself in patients with FND is different from those patients who do not have FND. We found that, for example, the amygdala, 
is hyperactive in patients who have FND. Now, the amygdala is the fear center. It's the part of the brain that gets activated when you're nervous or scared. That's, that's what we expect. Um, but whenever that happens, your, your brain cortex is able to turn off that amygdala. That's the reason why, for example, when you're watching a movie on TV and something you know, jumps up and scares you, you don't get up and punch the TV or run out of the room, right? You don't activate that fight or flight response because your brain cortex is able to tell the amygdala, it's just a movie, don't worry about it. In patients with FND, that amygdala is hyperactive and it gets activated when it's not supposed to. This is the reason why, yes, stress can bring out symptoms in FND, but patients who have FND can have their symptoms when they're scared, when they're happy, when they're hungry, when they're bored, when they're sleepy. Anything can bring it out because remember, it's a condition in which the brain or the mind take a stimulus and it converts it into a physical symptom. So anything can bring it out. On top of that, we've had studies that have shown that the part of the brain that should turn off that response, the, the brain cortex, is not as active as it should be in patients with FND. So patients with FND actually have a decreased capacity to turn off their amygdala. So they literally have a loss of control over how their brain reacts and responds to whatever's happening around them. And on top of that, they have a uh, inability to control their own brain and body. The last interesting thing I wanted to talk about is one more, one more finding, and it's the findings on the right temporal parietal junction. Now, the, the way that our brain works, whenever we decide to make a specific movement is as I, as I you know, I'm reaching my hand out to grab something out in front of me, my hand and nerves on my, on my arm are sending a signal up to my brain telling me what the temperature of the room is, how much my arm weighs, how much the object that I'm going to pick up weighs, how much uh, force I'm supposed to do. I mean, all of that information goes from the bottom to the top. At the same time, my brain has this pre-programmed software of how I'm supposed to do it. So my brain has this idea of what am I supposed to do when I reach out to pick up a glass of water? How am I supposed to move my arm when I reach out to, to do this task? Um, this is why when you try to reach out for a glass of water that you think is full but is actually empty, you pick it up and you throw it because the, the pre-programmed program was wrong. So whenever we decide to make a movement, we have that information that goes from the bottom to the top, and we have information that goes from the top to the bottom. The right temporal parietal junction takes those two streams of information, puts it together, and if they, those two match, that's when we say a movement is voluntary. So the right temporal parietal junction allows me to know whether or not a movement is or isn't voluntary. Well, it turns out that in patients who have FND, the right temporal parietal junction is not as active as it should be. So it's underactive. This is why they perceive these movements to be involuntary, because their brain is telling them this is not voluntary. And in fact, there seems to be high uh, preponderance of the information from the top down and pretty much not paying much attention to the information that should be coming from the bottom up. This also explains why when patients present with tics or with non-epileptic seizures or with episodes that look like stroke, they look like what tics and seizures and strokes look like on TV because this is what our brain believes a tic should look like. This also explains why patients with FND are often accused of faking it because what they're doing is what we all think this could look like, but we as physicians know that this is not what these symptoms actually look like. Um, so for patients who have this, uh, uh, this condition, there are ways to retrain the brain. There are ways to get them to be able to get back in control over the brain. The cornerstone of treatment for FND, number one, is making the diagnosis and delivering in an empathetic manner, in a kind manner that promotes acceptance of the diagnosis. Because lots of patients who have FND will tend to rely on avoidance and denial as a defense mechanism. So whenever something happens to them, they bottle it up, they bottle it up, they bottle it up, and then eventually it has to come out somehow, right? So they're very resilient because all of the difficult things that may or may not have happened in their life, they're able to push through it, but they keep bottling all these feelings up and eventually they come out somehow. And that also is the reason why we call this functional neurological disorder, 
because we believe that these symptoms serve a function. There's a reason why they're there. That the way in which the brain is letting this, uh, this uh, internal whatever come out. So first step is making the diagnosis and delivering it in a kind and empathetic manner so that we don't fall into that um, avoidance and, and denial uh, pattern. Number two, any comorbid conditions that are present that are associated with FND should also be treated. So for, like I said before, patients with FND tend to have a history of high prevalence of anxiety and depression. They're two separate things. It's, it, and they're two separate things that go together. So for, for example, diabetes and high blood pressure, they like to go hand in hand, but they're two separate things. Anxiety and FND, are two separate things as well. They like to go hand in hand, but they're different. Now, FND does not get better until anxiety is under better control. And I tell my patients, that's not me making up the rules, that's just the way it is. So step number two in treatment is getting that comorbid condition treated. This also includes in certain situations where there is a clear uh, social factor that needs to be addressed. Um, Working together with Dr. Kaufman, we have unfortunately seen scenarios where we discover that patients who have FND are victims of a social stressor. We have discovered patients who have been, for example, been abused, and the FND was their way in which their brain was managing this, this, uh, this stressor. So addressing any comorbid condition, both mental, physical, and social that could be contributing is step number two. Step number three has to do with the therapy portion of it. And what we know nowadays that or what has been proven to help is a specific type of therapy that's known as cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Now CBT is a therapy that's based on the fact that thoughts influence emotions, emotions influences behavior, and behavior influences thoughts. It's a self-feeding circle. So with CBT, you learn to recognize which thoughts and emotions lead to the specific symptom, and you learn how to break that cognitive cycle. So CBT therapists will teach patients how to do a specific type of breathing exercise, a physical exercise, a thought process, something that they do to, number one, recognize that pattern, and number two, break that pattern. Speaking in a neurological uh, terms, it's identifying when the amygdala is getting inappropriately activated and activating the brain cortex so that we can turn off this amygdala. Um, lastly comes the matter of the uh, videos, these, these TikTok ticks. Um, our brains also have these uh, groups of neurons that are known as mirror neurons. And these mirror neurons, we all have them. And there are neurons that activate whenever we see someone performing an action. So when you see someone yawning, what's the first thing that you want to do? You also want to yawn, right? It's because mirror neurons get activated. And we believe that there's a, an evolutionary reason why they're there. They're protective so that if you see a group of people that are running away from something, you don't stop to think what are they running away from. You'll run with them. It's, it's, it's a protective mechanism that, that we all have. In patients with FND, we know that they are highly, highly, highly suggestible and that these mirror neurons seem to be overactive. So patients with FND, whenever they see these, these videos of people who are having what they think looks like a tick, but we as physicians know is not actually a tick, um, their brains are getting the message of, this is a tick, we should start doing it, the mirror neurons get activated and they start to have them over and over. And then they get stuck in this cycle of, I saw this video, now I'm doing it. That means I have Tourette. And because I have Tourette, then I'm going to have more and more and more. So one of the important things that I talk to my patients about is understanding that whenever you watch one of those videos, you have to understand that that video does not represent what ticks actually look like. And in fact, none of my patients who have Tourette syndrome will make videos showing off their ticks. They just do not do that. One of the Classical things we know about Tourette's syndrome is that patients will try to hide their tics. They are embarrassed from doing their tics. So I could never see any of my Tourette patients making a video to show off the tics. Um, so I tell them, my patients with FND, that these videos, they don't represent what Tourette looks like. And just knowing that 
helps to turn off that automatic response that happens in the brain when you see that those those videos so that you don't perpetuate that that cycle now ideally i tell them to simply avoid those videos altogether but you know we live in a world of social media and sometimes as much as you try your those things are still going to to show up um and then lastly you know telling patients that fnd is something that is treatable it's curable and it goes away there is hope for them um but it has to be diagnosed it has to be identified and they should be evaluated by someone who knows about fnd ideally a, a neurologist who can explain the difference and help come up with a plan that's very patient to patient specific so um i'd love to take any questions and, and answer any any thoughts from the audience Thank you all so much. That was such a great presentation. Lots of wonderful information. Um, I do see lots of questions in here. So thanks everyone who has already submitted. We will do our best to get to all of the questions, but if they are not all answered, we will definitely be getting those the answers to those questions after the webinar has closed out. So the first question that I have for both of you is, my daughter was just diagnosed with FND. What is the best type of doctor to work with her on these symptoms? So FND is complex. And the first step is getting the, the appropriate diagnosis, which should happen with the help of a neurologist. Now you have to understand that even though there are some neurologists like myself who, who specialize in FND, one physician can't treat all of the issues. So typically you will need to have a multidisciplinary team. Usually there's a neurologist that's involved, a psychologist or social worker therapist is also involved. Sometimes we also need a social worker for any sort of issues that might be happening with school, with uh, the community or any troubles at home. Sometimes we also need to get psychiatrists involved because FND is sort of just the, the tip of the iceberg. And then we start to realize all the other issues that could be happening with patients. And in some situations, depending on the symptoms that patients might have, they they might also need help from a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. Um, there are even consensus guidelines that were put out by a group of experts from the United Kingdom, who um, who came up with these with these uh, guidelines on how to best treat patients with FND. And it's based on what I was talking about the bottom up and top down information. Sorry, did it backwards. <laughs> Um, and what they do with the physical therapy is different from, from what typically happens in physical therapy. Let's say, for example, someone who has a stroke. They have a stroke and they can't use their hand anymore. So what we do with physical therapy is we help them to try to use that hand more and more until they, their brain rewires so they can use it. In patients with FND, we do the exact opposite. Because the problem with FND is that there's not enough information, uh, attention being put on the information that's coming from the affected limb towards the brain. So what we do with patients with FND during physical therapy is we get them to start to use the unaffected limbs to be able to do whatever movements or activity they, they, they want to do so that the brain starts to pay more attention to the information that's coming from the bottom to the top. And when you, when you do that, the temporal parietal junction starts to get activated and they're able to start to pair the bottom up, top down, so that these movements can again become voluntary and they can start using the lens the way that they, they wanted to. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Would comorbid IED be a better way to speak about or categorize the rage attacks families report in Tourette's? Oh yes, absolutely. In fact, um, <laughs> A group of us um, who work with the TAA, myself included, and um, one to five other experts around the country, um, just re uh, just addressed this earlier this year um, to to shape and reshape the message about what has been referred to historically as Tourette rage as intermittent explosive behavior disorder. Um, and through the Tourette CDC partnership, 
there is actually now a 12 page um, behavioral outbursts, behavioral regulation um, document on the TAA website that the group of us created uh, has been reviewed and approved by the CDC. Um, yes, 100% um, what has been historically known as Tourette rage is in fact intermittent explosive behavior disorder. Um, and in that document, um, we actually go through numerous non-medication uh, strategies for helping to prevent, avoid, diffuse those situations um, so that they're not um, so devastatingly uh, difficult for families. Um, so please go to the TAA website uh, and you'll be able to find that document. Great, thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Okay, next question. My child crosses over. Some clear traditional TS characteristics, some FND characteristics. Any resources? Well, I, I, for, I'll let Julio talk about the resources, but I, I, I want to be clear that um, we are not in any way saying that you can't have both. Okay. Um, in fact, um, one of the studies um, that uh, Dr. Pringsheim and her colleague David Martino published um, was in, about, in adults who had rapid onset uh, functional neurologic disorder symptoms. So they had 35 individuals in their study, and 24 of those individuals were adults with Tourette who had had tick since childhood had watched videos of people doing these TikTok dramatic movements and then had development of those exact TikTok, like you look at them and you see that's, I saw this on TikTok and then I started doing it. So yes, patients with Tourette can have both. And that's why you really need to see a neurologist who's expert in, uh, knowing what is what to piece it out, because it is very common, even in patients with other neurologic conditions, like epilepsy, for patients to have epilepsy and then develop functional neurologic disorder symptoms that look like seizures, okay? So absolutely positively can have both. Um, and I'll let Julio talk about resources. Thanks, Keith. Uh, yes, I, I, I just wanna echo that 100%. FND is not protective of other conditions. And one of the biggest roles a neurologist has when taking care of a patient with FND is uh, helping them to figure out when what they have is FND and when it's something else. Uh, in FND, there's this common uh, scenario that in which patients will start off with one symptom and then develop another one and another one and another one. That's known as symptom substitution. It's very common in FND and I see it all the time. Um, when it comes to resources and, and what to do, number one, be very clear with, with your position and ask, what is FND and what is tick and Tourette syndrome? Because knowing how to differentiate those two is key. That education, of getting to know what's what is going to be very important. Um, because again, it helps to get the patient conscious and aware of what's happening so that they can be in control of their body. There are also a few websites that I, that I really like. Um, there is one out of Australia called FND Hope. Um, it's, a, it's a patient and uh, led website that has lots of good information. Um, there's also one that I recently discovered that I had not seen yet. It's called NeuroKid, and it's neurokid.co.uk. It has some wonderful information um, on, on FND, and it really helps to, to explain uh, the, the symptoms and where they come from. The, then there's the, the Stanford Functional Neurological Disorder website. They have some wonderful uh, education videos there and some handouts as well. Um, and there's an app that recently came out that's called My FND. I like the app because the app helps people to track 
what helps them to take back control over the brain. So it's not a, an app to track symptoms. I, I, I'm very clear with people. This app is not for, for tracking symptoms. This app is for tracking when you have a symptom, what have you done or what have you tried to make the symptom get better? And then you start to track them. The other thing I like about that app is it graphs um, your progress. So it's, it's nice to see that things actually might be getting better. Um, and the other thing I like about the app is it has some um, mindfulness uh, uh, techniques. It has like a deep breathing, a finger tapping one right there on the app. So I, I like that resource. But again, the number one thing is having the knowledge of which, which of my symptoms are FND and which of my symptoms are, are uh, tick and Tourette so that you know when to treat what. And then lastly, having a cognitive behavioral therapist involved who can help patient to patient with their specific issues, trying to, to help them get to know, as Keith said, what makes them tick. And in this case, what, what makes them have tick-like movements. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, next question. If someone was very knowledgeable on T on ticks or TS, would their FND symptoms appear more closely to organic ticks? Yeah, uh, so that's that's very interesting. Um, there's actually a known phenomenon in FND that's known as symptom modeling, and symptom modeling is when we unconsciously uh, model our symptoms after someone else. And I always give this example to my patients. I tell them that whenever my mom had a headache, she would do this. Whenever I get a headache. I do this. I don't know why I do it. It's just something that I unconsciously learned to do. What we used to see in patients with FND is that there tended to be a history of a family member, a classmate, a neighbor, someone who had the illness, let's say, for example, epilepsy, and then they would unconsciously model their symptoms after this other person. So the symptom modeling, yes, 100%, it can happen in patients who already have uh, Tourette syndrome or any other tick disorder. Um, but there's always some subtle difference. There's always something that the patient can tell. It's different this time because of X, Y, or Z reason. Like, I've had this blinking tick my entire life, but ever since X point in time, now I'm blinking uncontrollably. And along with the blinking, I'm making a noise. And along with the blinking, I'm turning my head. I mean, those extra characteristics are what help me to rule it in because I'm having all these extra things or there's a difference in the way that the patient is perceiving it, um, or there's been a, there's a clear association with with something that's bringing these out. Great, thank you. So I know that you touched on this very briefly at the end, but quite a few questions came in about CBIT being helpful for FND. So if you wanted to elaborate on that, let let me clarify that. Um, so, and I figured this question was going to come up. Um, so there is CBIT, which is Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Tick. That is the the tick-based sensory motor therapy that has been proven time and time again to be effective, even for treating adults with Tourette. What Dr. Quezada mentioned was CBT, no I. No CBT, I. <laughs> which is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, so the two are, are very, very similar in sound, um, completely different in practice, um, as he mentioned. Um, so um, that's that's the big clarifying, uh, and I figured we would have to clarify that at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's there's some thought that CBIT might be helpful in FND, but um, no I'm one's... speaking out of my own experience. Right. I, I, I haven't seen it be helpful. I've actually right. seen it make things worse for patients because you're bringing too much attention to the movement in and of itself and not enough attention to the actual sensory phenomena that's coming from, from the body. So um, uh, again, this is just me, my own personal experience. I don't think that CBIT is helpful for FND. I think that CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is helpful for FND. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, there were many questions if CBIT was effective or useful for FND. So thank you for clarifying. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Um, my brother is 18 and we are trying to figure out if he has FND or Tourette's 
what should we do? What should we be asking my brother to help us differentiate between FND and Tourette? The, the biggest thing, it's, it's not really asking him, it's getting him to the right kind of physician who is going to be able to um, do a thorough, take a thorough history, do a thorough exam. So the thing with both of these conditions is you didn't hear us talk about a single test um, in terms of diagnosing, right? These conditions, both Tourette and FND, are diagnosable by people who are expertly trained um, because it's all in the history and it's all in the exam. So find him a neurologist. Uh, if it's a neurologist that is an expert in movement disorders, um, that would be an absolutely ideal situation. If it's a neurologist who has expertise in Tourette, then that's you know sort of the mega millions jackpot situation. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, instead of trying to figure it out yourselves, um, find an expert neurologist, and he or she will be able to to help sort it out for him. Yeah, I think that. Um... There have been situations where patients have come to see me for the first time for, for FND. And as we're talking, we discover that while 98% of their movements are FND, it turns out that there's one that I think is, is tick. And it's really hard. Sometimes it can be so, so subtle um, that, that, I mean, you need, you need an expert to help you find, uh, find these answers. Another place you can go to is the FND Society website. They have a find a provider tab there that, that can help you with finding someone who, who specializes in FND. But you know, big rule of thumb, a nice place to start is a general neurologist who can help guide you in one direction or the other and help you to find a movement disorder specialist if you need one or an FND specialist if you need one. Because again, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, sometimes it's both. And that's a very complex, tricky situation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll take uh, just a few more questions here. Okay. Um, can a person who's had Tourette syndrome tics since childhood also develop FND? Yes, <laughs> as I mentioned, um, one of the many studies that Dr. Pringsheim and her group have done has showed that uh, in 35 adults who who showed up to to their office with new onset functional neurologic disorder, very clear, watched TikTok videos, developed the same movements. 24 out of those 35 adults with FND, 24 of them had Tourette. Um, since childhood and then developed FND by watching videos of people doing these ticks. 100% yes. Yes, 100%. Like I mentioned, FND is not protective of other conditions um, and neither is Tourette. <laughs> so just because someone has Tourette doesn't mean that they couldn't at some point also have FND. I mean, it, it, it can happen. Um, one point I'd like to also make is that both ticks and Tourette and tick-like movements in FND, they are both very um, susceptible to attention. And the more attention that's put on them, the more that they're going to happen. So we see this with kids who start to have the blinking tick and parents will say, hey, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. All of that does is it makes it way worse. Same thing happens with FND. A patient will start to have the, the movements and then everyone is on them asking, why is this happening? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? The best thing that can be done with anyone who has takes before they are able to see a specialist is trying to take a step back and say, these look like ticks. Let's not pay too much attention to them because that can only make it worse and start to give some reassurance that whether it's Tourette syndrome or whether it's FND, it's it's treatable. One of the two is curable um, and and there are specialists out there who can help. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, that is all the time that we have for the webinar this evening. There were a ton of questions. 
However, um, we are going to table this for another time and I am going to get all of your questions to the two presenters today so they can kind of give you all the answers that you need. Some are related to FND and some not. So I want to just be conscious of everyone's time and get you all the information that you need. So thank you both again for a wonderful presentation. Many wonderful comments in the question box that I will definitely share with you after. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the, all the time we have for the webinar. Once the webinar is closed, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would be greatly appreciative if you wouldn't mind completing that and provide your feedback. You will also receive an email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of the webinar. Additionally, the webinar will be posted on the TA's YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us about this webinar or for any other ideas and suggestions that you may have. On behalf of the Tread Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. And I will be following up with answers to your questions um, as soon as I get them all to the doctor. So thank you again. Um, thank you, Dr. Kizada and Dr. Kaufman, and I hope you all have a great evening.